It's like a symphony of manipulating and spinning and flipping the cards in your hands. It's like each move inspires the next and you're not even thinking about it. The cards are dancing between the hands. They're spinning around, they're flipping over, they're doing things you wouldn't even expect them to be doing. It's just so surprising, almost magical. For as long as I can remember, we've always done things in tandem together. We both got into magic around the age of 12. We would go to the library and check out books by Daya Vernon, Guy Hollingworth. Just seeing the illustrations, we're like, wow, we can do this with playing cards. When we started practicing cardistry, it wasn't a thing. It has its roots in magic. It comes from card magicians who would use what is called the card flourish. And these were used to accentuate certain moments in a magic trick. So we took that and just ran with it. We were the first to embrace it and really focus on it and practice it as its own thing and promote it as its own thing. Cardistry is very much like skateboarding. You know, we practice these tricks until we have them down perfect. You know, we see other tricks and we're like, oh, we gotta learn that. You have 52 playing cards and the possibilities to, to maneuver those around are endless. You can hold a deck of cards in your hand and it's one solid block. Now imagine lifting up another block, so now you have two. Well, what can you do with those two blocks in your hands? Well, you can create more blocks and we call those packets and you can start maneuvering and spinning and flipping those packets between your fingers. It's hard, like it takes a lot of dexterity. It's all practiced, it's all rehearsed, and when you're truly a master, you can just start doing things on the fly and you don't even have to think about it. What kids are doing today with cards is mind-blowing. If you would have told me that when I was 14 years old, I would have been like, that's the coolest thing. I had no idea it could even be this big. The ultimate goal would be to get people to almost put cardistry first when they see a deck of playing cards. You know, it's no longer for games. It's no longer for gambling. It's cardistry. We are a circus of big family tradition and the way we present our show is the same way that my family presented the show over 175 years ago. There's nothing fancy about what we do here. It's magic. Real magic. When you grow up in a circus as a child, you just step into being a clown. Benvenuti, benvenuti tutti! Welcome to the Zoppe Circus, thank you for coming! We're a classic family circus, which means our families here working together, performing together. Would you like to meet some of our family? First of all, there's my mother, the matriarch of our family. Then I have my sister Carla, who, with her husband Rudy, they perform with her dog act. And then we have my sister Tosca, she has the horses on the show, but she also directs the show. Her husband, Jay, is an amazing white clown. The white clown is the straight clown. He's the best white clown that I've ever seen. The act that my son and I do right now in a show is actually a balloon routine. It's nothing new. I mean, it's thousands of years old. Clowns have been doing it forever. It happens to be really cute when he does it because he's adorable. It's an, it's an unexplainable thing to see my child do what he loves to do. I mean, this, I get this seven-year-old beautiful little boy, and his heart opens up and he gives it to everybody. It's different here, I think, than most places. When we come into this ring, we become family. I believe circus and family are basically the same word. Ni 
In Ghana, coffins can look like this. They're carved into whimsical shapes and painted bright colors meant to represent a person's life or occupation. Anand and his family are at the center of these extravagantly designed, larger-than-life coffins made in the shape of whatever one desires. It started about 65 years ago with an odd request from a chief to be buried in a coffin shaped like a cocoa pod. From there, the request kept coming in, and Anand's father realized he had a serious business on his hands. While funerals are a sad occasion in Ghana, many also see them as an opportunity to celebrate the deceased. When an order comes in for one of their coffins, they first get the measurements of the deceased, carve the wood into the shape of the family's choosing, create an opening, and sand it for smoothness. It then goes to an artist for painting. Once the interior is stuffed, it's ready to be delivered to the family. And these coffins are not only delivered locally. Los Angeles, Denmark, Russia. As for Anand, he already has his picked out. There's three things that are most important to chefs. First is flavor, second is flavor, and third is flavor. Flavor rules. Built on the fertile former lake bottom soil of northern Ohio, the Chef's Garden is a 300-acre family farm that grows specialty produce for some of the world's best restaurants. The Chef's Garden is a small family farm that has the good fortune of working directly with some of the greatest chefs in the world. In many cases, we're working with plant growers that are breeding to be able to create new plants. Not genetic modification, but genetic selection. The farm grows produce of all shapes and sizes, like miniature carrots, these white strawberries, and almost a hundred varieties of microgreens. But the Jones family wasn't always the chef's garden. My parents had had some very successful years. In 1983, they had a very devastating hailstorm, and ultimately, the farm collapsed. We were dealt a new deck of cards and found opportunity within a disaster. We met a European-influenced chef, Iris Balin, who said, grow me varieties for flavor. Grow me varieties without chemical. I want a zucchini bloom. Thought this lady was absolutely crazy. Little did we know, she knew a heck of a lot more about it than we did. And that really opened our eyes to another whole world out there. We hooked up with some really great chefs early on. Folks like Danielle Ballou and Jean-Georges von Richten and Alain Ducasse and Michel Richard and then Thomas Keller and Charlie Trotter and, and Ritz Carlton chefs and Four Seasons chefs and they've allowed us an existence in agriculture. We're indebted to those chefs that have given us the privilege and the path to be able to follow our dream of farming. So it's that symbiotic relationship of chef and farmer working together for the greater good. And here we are 35 years later, still working to get better. To the best of our ability, right now, in this place, I think we're doing the right thing. And I think that trumps every other reason for whatever you do in this life. If people could understand that 
this is akin to the scariest thing you've ever done, then they'll start to understand why we're so addicted to it. When I put the goggles on, the first thing I'm doing is trying to calm down. It totally puts you inside the drone. You just forget where you are. I'm Conrad Miller, also known as Ferrati, and I'm a drone racer. I started in September 2014, and that was like the ground floor. Of all the activities I've partaken in, motorcycles and flying drones are on the same level in terms of intensity. Oh. It's cool when you have a hobby and you can do it and you love it, but when you can share it with your kids, I mean, that's just, you know, that's just like what it's all about, I think. Okay, so the props are good. Flying and racing with Sorel has just been a pure joy. He's a good kid and he's a talented kid. And I think it comes easy to tell any kid like that because they don't feel the pressure that adults do. Good landing. <laughs> Coming in hot. This is harder than anything else I've done. And it's because when, you're, when your nerves go, your fine motor skills go. Kids don't care, they're just having fun. And they just learn much faster. The course in LA is at the Hawthorne Mall, which is abandoned. It's been abandoned since the 80s, I believe. And it looks like a place where you would go if there was a zombie apocalypse. When I go into races, I feel like I put a lot of pressure on myself to win. You know, I want all of my practice and all of my time flying to show for something. I was flying fine, I wasn't nervous, but I was just a little too high and crashed. You like almost hit the ceiling, you're like mm. Everybody is just working really hard to be the best at it. And it's just gonna get tougher and tougher. I took that 180 good. <laughs> yeah, you did. Flying with Sorrel now, it kind of gives me an opportunity to look at it from a different perspective because I can coach him. You ready? Mm-hmm. Go for it. He's aware enough to know that he gets to do these things that most kids don't get to do. He's flying a drone, which is this groundbreaking thing. Dang it! <laughs> we hit each other. You hit me. What are you talking about? We hit each other. You know, as parents, we don't always feel like we do enough. I brought him into drone racing, and he knows he's lucky and he knows he's fortunate. Yeah, kiddo, you're going pretty quick. And you know, he's just he's grateful for everything that he gets. 